I'm calling the meeting of the Finance Committee to order. It is uh, the meeting of Thursday, July 2nd, and uh, it is a meeting where we are going to be um, meeting with the Public Safety Department to hear public safety issues as the principal purpose of the meeting. Um, I'm going to now, for um, just a moment, put up on the screen the agenda for today's meeting. And um, I'd just like to remind everybody that pursuant to Governor Baker's March 12, 2020 order suspending 38 Section 18, this meeting of the Finance Committee and Town Council is being, um, uh, according to remote participation. And in order to do that, I have to um, go through the process of asking each member of the Finance Committee to indicate that they have heard me by um, responding, uh, um, saying that they have heard me or are present as I go through the list. And then I'm going to ask the council president to call the council to order and she will have to do a similar process for members of the council who are not members of the Finance Committee. Finance Committee consists of um, five members of the council um, and uh, myself and four others, so I'm gonna ask them first. Uh, Dorothy Pam, are you uh, present? Yes. Uh, Kathy Shane. Yes. Pat Angelus. Pat, unmute and let us know you can be heard. Sorry, yes, I'm here and I can hear. Okay, um, and Lynn Griesmer. Yes, I can hear. Okay, and then uh, the three members of the committee who are uh, not counselors, um, but full members of the committee according to the um, council rules and charter. Uh, Bob Hegner. I'm present. Okay, Sharon Povinelli. Present. And Mary Lou Talman. Mary Lou? Yes, I am here. Okay, so uh, we have confirmed that all members of the uh, committee um, have been able to participate and are able to participate in the meeting. Lynn, uh, did you want to call the council to order? Yes, uh, I, this time at 2.33 on July 2nd, I'm calling a council meeting to order as part of the town finance committee um, meeting as well. And the people I need to check on are the following. Mandy Jo Haneke, can you hear me? Yes, I can. George Ryan, can you hear me? Yes, I can hear you. Okay, Andy, do you want to check on the other people who will be speaking today? Um, I don't think it's necessary um, according to the open meeting law. Um, and if we have problems, we will note it as we go through. Um, the, um, I just want to alert you to uh, what the agenda is for today's meeting and uh, what the order is going to be it's only very slightly changed from the agenda as presented here uh public safety is going to be first and consists of um i think that, that so my understanding the police department has decided that they would like to go first and so we're going to go in the order that they have uh, requested uh the one change that is made here is that general public comment will be third item so that after the public safety presentations i will be um, recognizing any members of the public who wish to make comments to the committee about the issues that are for the committee today uh, we will then talk um, as a committee about where we are with the budget review process um, and that will conclude the meeting so um, with that, I'm going to take the uh, sharing down so we can uh, get back to a more normal view. 
and um, I want to thank the um, members of our public safety departments for being present. And um, what we normally do is have a brief presentation um, by the chief about the budgets being presented um, and then um, turn it up, open it up to questions from members of the finance committee and additional members of the council regarding the budgets as being presented. Uh, Chief Livingstone, welcome. Good afternoon, How, how's everybody doing? Um, Andy, uh, typically I oversee the Animal Welfare Communication Center and the police budget. So do you wanna hear from all three of those? I'm assuming you do, as in the past. I think we do, but um, obviously, why don't we just do it in the order? Um, it, and uh, since uh, police facilities is usually very quick, you can go ahead and start and just do it in the order as presented to the, in the book, and then people can follow along in the budget book. And for members of the public, um, if there are any in attendance, and I don't see any at this moment, um, should be aware that the town manager's budget is available on the town website and you look under government budget and then look for the town manager's budget. Um, but all members of the council and the committee have copies and uh, please chief go ahead and um, uh, give us a, just a quick presentation on the um, facilities budget and where we are there. Okay, if you want me to go right down the list, then Andy, I'll start with the police facilities budget. Um, the police facilities budget itself is not actually drafted by myself, but it's uh, Rob Moore and Jeremiah who put that presentation together. Um, I will give them typically suggestions and recommendations about what needs to be replaced in the building. Um, and so I will just go through the recent accomplishments as far as the facility itself. It's almost 30 years old. It's still in outstanding shape. We have one full-time maintenance person who oversees it, uh, Deb Cormier, who does an outstanding job. Um, but as you can see, we've had a replacement of the community room, which gets a lot of use with new furniture and um, carpeting and uh, also renovations to the communication center kitchen and the kitchen that was uh, used by the police officers themselves. But uh, as far as the actual budget and expenses, that isn't something I typically, um, I typically present. But if there are questions about the facility specifically, I'm more than happy to answer those to the best of my ability. Otherwise, I'll go right into the police budget. Okay, so I'll just stop for a second and see. Uh, Kathy has a hand up. Uh, or do you I, I just had a couple questions. Um, it's noted in the longer term that you're going to need a roof. Um, yes. And I didn't know whether, and I don't think we need the information now since it's not, I know it's not on next year's capital budget or the coming year, but your estimate of when that's going to come to us. And um, I see you've also had an internal a couple different audits on energy efficiency and on solar and that you're going to be starting to implement some of those um, just some sense of are we heading towards solar uh, or not um, and again when would that expense come and my last question is related to something I saw on communication that yeah. you're you're considering the possibility longer term of being a regional communication center. And do you, so the question was about space. It, is our space big enough if we went regional to accommodate that? So those are my three, the roof, energy efficiency, and space if we were to go regional. Sure. So specific to the roof, uh, it is a, um, a area that we have been uh, discussing with facilities people about um, replacing. Uh, so it's my understanding there has money been appropriated for the roof replacement section for FY21 and then that needs to be replaced first and then the discussion about solar and solar costs would take place. So I don't, solar certainly won't be taking place in FY21. 
but the roof shingles uh, and structure needs to be replaced first and then they're going to have the discussion about uh, adding the solar to it. It's an area though that we want it to happen um, pretty consistently every year. Uh, the discussion is about the cost of running this facility, which is 24 7, 365. I think it's probably the most expensive facility to run every year um, from a cost of you know fuel and electricity and that sort of thing. So I know that the roof itself is to be replaced in FY21, or that's my understanding, and then the solar is to come afterwards. So probably FY22. Um, as far as the communication center on the third floor of the police facility, um, those are conversations that we continue to try and find partners with. Most recently, Belchertown and Hadley. If it were to become a regional this uh, dispatch center, which is what we're hoping for and want. We could accommodate up to three other communities of that size. If we were to look at a much larger uh, regional approach to communications, I know the discussions were that once a decision was made on a new fire facility, we would probably incorporate a new communication system into that, into that blueprint, into that um, construction phase. So that's kind of where we stand. Okay, thank you. Uh, Kathy, if you don't have a follow-up on Mass Mandy Joe, whose hand was up, um, and I'm just uh, trying to get through all members of the committee and the council who have questions, have hands up for this, this segment. Mandy. Sure. Yeah, um, I, I just have a follow up on the communication center, the regionalization of it. Um, so I, it's sort of a piggyback on Kathy's question. Um, how would the impacts on, how would that regionalization impact funding? Would we get, you know, because it might include increased maintenance or increased operational costs. Um, how, I, I assume that would be some sort of regionalization agreement that might allow us to help maintain the building a little bit more, but I'd, I'd like, you know, some thinking on that and what would it be the impact of the facility? Um, she talked about size, Kathy asked about size, but the extra use potentially of it. Um, and then the other question is about the electricity per se, which I've noticed has gone up dramatically in kilowatt usage in the last five years. Um, and I, I'm wondering if there's a reason for that. I know that's kind of into the weeds, but when we're looking at reducing electricity, it was, it was curious to see how much that's increased. You know, I, Mandy, at least, Mandy Joe, specific to the electricity cost, I don't have an answer for you on why it's gone up so significantly. Um, you know, pretty much the manpower has remained the same and our manpower in the communication center has remained the same. The, we have just recently changed some of the, um, the boilers and the boiler systems, which were old. So I don't know, and that just happened this past year. So I don't know if that fact that going to a more efficient set of boilers is going to bring that cost back down or that usage back down. But I know that was a concern with the, um, with Rob Moore and maintenance and, and things. And that's kind of why I had been pushing for so many years to really start thinking about solar when we replace the roof. Um, so I don't actually have a, a legitimate answer on, on why that has gone up so dramatically. Um, as far as the size and the ability of the communications and its current blueprint, we can accommodate um, two more dispatch centers um, with the current setup the way it is. We have the ability to um, you know, have, have additional dispatch personnel up there. If we were to take on partners of the size of either Belchertown and Hadley and or both, we could accommodate uh, the added call volume with the current structure that we have there now. So we wouldn't need any additional build outs. Uh, we wouldn't need any addition, uh, additional construction for uh, the call volume that would represent taking on Belchertown and or Hadley at this time. Can I just have quickly follow up, Andy? And if we did, would we have some sort of agreement where they help pay for the costs associated to that?
I can answer that, Andy. Um, so yes, there would be an agreement um, with both those towns that they would incorporate some of the cost. Um, we also believe it would be a savings for the town of Amherst and a savings for both Belchertown and Hadley because they would actually be able to eliminate all of their full-time positions except for probably one. So we would, we would take on one each full-time position from Belchertown and Hadley, but of course they would incur the cost on that. So we understand, um, or we believe there would be savings across the board for both ourselves um, and for both Belchertown and Hadley. And we also know that we would be getting increases from state E911 if we became a regional center. So the grant funding part that we get from the state uh, would increase as well. Thank you, Chief. Uh, just so everybody knows, uh, because I've been on the from my original days on the Finance Committee, uh, which is around uh, 2007 on, this uh, goal of trying to get to a regional dispatch approach um, is a more cost-effective approach for us and for the communities that would join us has been a long standing and ongoing discussion. Um, I see two other people with questions on this segment of the budget, and then we should move on. Uh, Dorothy Pam. Uh, I'd like to ask if the, they have considered um, having the communication center um, a secure energy center, in other words, uh, off the grid, so that in case of disaster, no matter what else happened, that would continue to function. So yes, Dorothy, um, we are actually this summer working on a backup system that would be located at the North Fire Station. Okay. Um, so we're in the process of doing that currently and we are, we are applying for a grant for the equipment, equipment that would be necessary to do that up at North Fire. Um, okay. okay. Okay, thank you. You're welcome. And Mary Lou Tomlin. Mary Lou, did you have a question? Yes, I do. Hello? Yes, please go forward. We can okay. hear you. I, I was wondering if the um, combination of the roof and the solar, doing it at the same time would be a greater savings over time. Obviously, you know, um, the, the, it's, a, it's a money issue, but it may be more cost effective if we did it all at once rather than doing it at two different times. Yes, uh, Lynn, you had... Uh... Yeah, very quickly, first of all, I'm very glad to see in here the desire to maintain this building at its current uh, use because one of the things we're dealing with is all the other buildings in town that we have not been able to maintain. And the second thing is, I am I correct that the call center already covers the other towns that we provide ambulance service to. I, I could defer the question about ambulances maybe to the fire department guys because we lost that contract. But I know we still do dispatch for fire and ambulance for some of the regional towns, yes. Right, okay, thank you. I wanted to get back to Mary Lou's question really quickly about uh, the order of doing things what's the most cost-effective approach? I was kind of hoping Lynn was going to answer that for me, but... <laughs> I, I will answer it from my own experience. It makes no difference. They're two different companies. Roofers don't install solar, and solar doesn't, don't install roofs. Well, unless you have a different experience. So, so I would suggest that on these, these level of questions that you wait for the maintenance budget to come in, it's really Rob Mora and Jeremiah who are probably going to run these projects anyway so yeah okay we'll do that so then we can get onto the police department unless there's any additional questions about the facility um so pat did you have something before we go on I thought, otherwise i would like to go on no i well no i was uh, trying to get ready for going on and also i'm going to say that i seem to be on this screen in two places one where you can see me and I'm talking, but my name is also listed with a non-video thing. And I have no idea why that is. And I don't know whether that means something is happening. So I just wanted to put that out there. 
Okay. Athena can. Um, I'll, I'll remove the extra patent. Thank you. <laughs> One of me is right. enough. So, so back to the chief. Uh, I'm sure we turn to the police uh, budget. Sure. So, I, and I'll try and, I know Sean wanted us to try and stay to about five minutes. Um, and we'll see how that goes, but I'll, I'll run that through this relatively quickly as far as the police budget, and I'm sure there'll be a lot of questions, but, um, you know, our mission statement was a mission statement that was developed with the police department and the community in mind, and that was something we changed about six years ago, and we're in process of looking at um, redeveloping that mission statement as, as at this year as we speak. Um, recent accomplishments and current challenges. Um, you know, you see all the bullets in front of you about our accomplishments and what we're very proud on our community outreach with SEPTED and um, community outreach. I think when you look back at our call volume, a lot of the calls that have been reduced are specific to all the work that we've done in community outreach, most of it towards the campus and community coalition group. Um, our crisis intervention team and our DART team deals more specifically with mental health issues in town that we are, you know, pretty constantly dealing with. We're very, very proud of the work we've done with, with that group as well. Um, you know, we continue um, to, you know, recruitment is a challenge in our profession um, as far as both police recruits and getting officers to apply for the positions. Um, it's something that you know, we involve the community with and our HR department with frequently. Um, long range objectives, I will continue on. Um, you know, we're continuing to work uh, on, if I get the majority of, of emails and calls that I get are probably from people requesting traffic traffic enforcement in their neighborhood. So it's an area, you know, we continue to stress and work on. Um, continue to working with our schools, provide the resources that they need specific to uh, keeping the school environment safe. Uh, our updates for objectives, um, you know, you can see those most have been are either continuing to be ongoing or accomplished. Um, Know, all the strategies that we have going on um, about the work that we're doing in town um, are, are there in front of you. So I'll answer questions specific to that. And then um, where we stand with our FY21 objectives to expand and implement, uh, continue work with our step TED team and community outreach groups. Um, forever looking for grants and funds to um, you know, help us work uh, better on uh, anything that we do within the community, whether it's our um, opioid task force groups, our DART officers, our crisis intervention group, our rope adventure course that we do with, with um, community members, uh, everything that we've done department and town wide with our Alice training and, and alert training and um, and that, that's pretty much self-explanatory as far as our FY21 objectives. You know, as far as our staffing levels, we are we are currently um, budgeted at 48. We currently have on staff 44 officers. We have three that are currently in the academy who will be graduating this month. Um, so we. Um, have one vacancy. We're anticipating probably three retirements this coming year. So, um, you know, that, that's going to be continue to be a challenge as far as recruitment and the recruitment process. Um, not sure what else uh, you want me to cover, Andy. With I thought it would be more geared towards uh, questions and that sort of thing. So I'll stop there. If there are very specifics you want me to address as far as the budget. I'd be more than happy to, but I, you know, again, 90, 93% of our budget is, is uh, divvied up into personnel and, and then the, um, the rest of supplies, maintenance and that sort of thing. So that's kind of where we stand.
anything I missed? Did we lose Andy? Do, do you see Andy anywhere? We, we did lose Andy. Okay. Um, uh oh. <laughs> okay. Um, and Andy noted that at the beginning that he has some issues in his house um, and that he would move to another room. So I am temporarily taking over as chair. Um, Our very own Alexander Haig. Yes, I am. I am. I am the, the sub, the sub, uh, whatever. Um, and I see uh, one person, I think Pat's hand was up first. And I know that she was uh, prepared to be talking about this. So Pat, do you want to lead off? We still have Pat. Ah, Andy's back. I just called on Pat, Andy. Pat's muted. Pat? Uh -oh. I'm unmuted, but what I said was um, I have lowered my hand temporarily. Oh, okay. I didn't the first question I had was already answered in terms of the uh, two openings uh, and whether that was budgeted or not. Um, and I have other questions, but I'll wait uh, to see how things go. Okay. Thank Andy, you. do you want to take over? Or do you want Because <laughs> there, I'm going to raise my hand too, but I see Dorothy and Sharon both have questions. Um, why don't you go ahead with the, um, just follow that order and you ask your questions and then we'll go with Dorothy and Sharon and then if the, I have a question that I'll ask after. Well, I'm going to call on them first because they had their hands up the, in the interim. So Dorothy, why don't you go? Okay. I wanted some more explanation on the CPTED, the Community Policing Through Environmental Design Teams. Um, wanting to know, uh, it said you're planning to increase that. Um, how does that affect uh, personnel plans and costs? Um, in other words, what are they, I gather that means that they're not in the police station, that they're out and about doing things. Um, but how is it different from what you have been doing? So, yeah, also, thank you. Can you hear me now? Yes. Okay. So yeah, our, our crime prevention through environmental design mostly exists through one officer, Bill Laramie. It's a national program and it's a nationally recognized program. We're an award-winning program when it comes to the work that we've been able to do and accomplish through Officer Laramie and the work that he does. But he's kind of the kingpin of the SEPTED, you know, operation. But we do incorporate all the other police officers in some way, shape, or form. So, you know, North Amherst has been getting the brunt of the, you know, concentration on our efforts. And typically what would happen is uh, we'll, we'll find a problem in a neighborhood. And I'll use Grantwood as an example now where we've been having some issues up there. So Bill will kind of over, Officer Laramie will kind of oversee and identify what the issues are. And then the officers that are assigned to that, you know, sector will be also responsible about working with Bill to find reasons and ways that we can fix the specific problems. It may be a problem with a lot of noise disturbances or parties. It may be a specific neighborhood that's dealing with house break-ins or that sort of thing. So once the problem is identified, Officer Laramie will kind of oversee and coordinate either group meetings, neighborhood meetings, or officer involvement, and, and take care of that issue. And that's kind of the idea behind the um, sector-based policing philosophy that we uh, started some 10 years ago, is identify problems, find solutions, and work through those solutions to, a, to an agreed upon recommendation. Thank you. You're welcome. Sharon? Um. I have two. I have two quick questions. Um, one um, under the uh, status update of FY20 objectives, um, you state that uh, you're developing a strategy to contend with anticipated uh, increases in motor vehicle collisions and fatalities, uh, and I believe that's due to. Um, associated with the legalization of recreational marijuana. Um, however, in the, um, if you look on the next page, like looking at 
motor vehicle crashes and motor vehicle violations, those two areas seem to be going down um, in incidents. And so I wondered um, if you could speak to that a little. And sure. then um, my other uh, question was concerning the full-time community outreach officer for downtown. Yep. Um, is is there an aspect of that that I know policing has changed a lot in 30 or 40 years, but um, is that a feet on the street person um, or is that somebody who, um, you know, is more in your building? Um, I'm just, you know, I obviously I have a business downtown. Um, sure. There's often a lot of um, people who are, uh, uh, um, challenged, um, you know, in, in the parks. Um, so I'm just wondering if you could speak to that a little. Sure. Thank so you. the first part about the um, FY20 objectives about developing strategies for increases in collisions and fatalities, that was based on what we had heard and we heard from reports from other states that had already enacted the legalization of marijuana laws. Um, Quite frankly, the good news is we haven't seen the same types of issues that the, they've seen in both Colorado and the Washington area. We were anticipating a larger number of crashes associated with an uptick in marijuana use, but we, and we haven't seen it. I think that's a good thing. Um, you know, even our OUI arrests are down, and you know, we were having a discussion earlier today about it. And um, the good thing is education was an integral part of that, and the usage of Uber in this town is very high and we think that's had an impact on it as well. So quite frankly, um, as far as the expectations of increased accidents, we just haven't seen it, which is really good news from our perspective. So, um, you know, as far as the downtown outreach officer, that is a foot officer and or bike officer, weather dependent, sometimes he's in a cruiser, but the expectation is he walks and or bikes downtown, gets to know the business owners better um, and or the individuals who are hanging out, um, you know, downtown more frequently, whether it's, you know, issues with homelessness or, or other individuals. But, uh, that is an officer. It's Officer Casey Nagel. He, uh, he is out there, uh, you know, he works a four and two shift. So he's out there, you know, whatever his four shifts of the week are, he is out there and he is dealing with downtown issues. So that's not us. That's not an office person. That's a police officer in uniform who's downtown. Um, Andy, um, maybe I could ask my questions now and then you know, see who else. So uh, I was, um, both of those were on my list. So thank you others for asking them. Um, I was looking at the service calls um, and the mix of them. And one question is, I'm assuming, but I might not be right, that you enter a call into just one category or could some of these be the same person was in three or four categories? Um, so that's just an overall question. And then I have a second one about the mix. So if I understand your question correctly, can one individual be when a call comes in for whatever the service may be, whether it's a noise disturbance or a, um, you know, let's say just somebody complaining about somebody hanging out in the town common or something. So there, there, it is possible that somebody would be responsible for more than one, we call it a CAD computer generated um, dispatch. So one individual could be responsible for more than one call. That is true, yes. Yeah. Because uh, uh, then what I was doing, I might not have been able to do what I was doing. So I was adding up um, uh, calls for domestic violence, rape, sexual assault, restraining order, mental health, you know, sort of clusters. And yep. if I add those up, I get to um, about a thousand of the calls. Um, so I don't know whether maybe the original call was nuisance and you got out there and found it was a mental health concern. So, what, what I want to focus on that is the training that your team has. Um, mm -hmm. And as you think of vacancies in de the department, would you, you know, it, it seems to me that, that wouldn't be typically what 
police academy would train you for, some of them are health related, would you potentially be able to hire either a specially trained person out of a police academy or can you hire a different kind of person and make them a team team up with a police officer? So I don't know how much flexibility you have in the staff mix if you see you know, this, these don't seem to me sometimes even you necessarily want to have a police uniform be the only uniform someone's seeing, but you need someone there. So that's the, the question of the, the mix of the team. So uh, when a recruit officer gets trained at the academy, their, their academy training is pretty basic. So they wouldn't be an officer who would be part of a sexual assault investigation team, not for many, many years. Um, you know, there needs to be some experience uh, for an officer. So it wouldn't really fall into the lap of a, a new police officer. They get very basic training uh, specific to domestic violence or, or rape investigation, that sort of thing. One of the good things, one of the really great things that I'm very proud of in this agency, specific to sexual assault is the grant we did with the University of Massachusetts. Yeah, five years ago, uh, close to a half a million dollar grant where we actually have a civilian advocate who works in our building. Um, she works directly with the victims of anything related to domestic violence. So if an officer responds to a call, um, she is immediate, immediately contacted and works with that victim right through the process uh, of court hearings, works with the police officers. She has complete access to and an office right here in our building. And she is funded through a grant that we've had for over five years now. Um, one area where we're very proud of. We are looking to expand that into mental health fields as well. Um, we have a grant that we have and Captain Young can talk a little bit more about it with our crisis intervention team members. We have a grant that was written with CSO Northampton. Um, and that very question had we started to work on this spring was about duplicating what we've done with the domestic violence advocate and having a mental health advocate in the facility in this building as well. So that's an area that we're looking to expand. Ronnie, do you want to add anything on that? Very briefly, Chief. I mean, one of one of the models that we see nationally, and I, I would love to replicate it here for our community, is the call response. So you'll notice that our mental health calls have risen over the last couple of fiscal years. Some of that is self-initiated activity as we deal with people for aftercare reasons. Um, we recognize that we're not clinicians, but what we try to do is make them make different resources available to them. The current models nationally are that if you have a response from a police officer that's formed a relationship with these people, the clinician can then take over um, care for this patient, get them wired in when they need to be wired in. That costs money, of course, so you know we are actively searching out various grants that are available to the Department of Mental Health, even at the federal level, to try to make that happen for our community. Thank you. Thank you. I, I think what I heard you say is right now the approach is to the extent you can fund a grant for this, uh, uh, it wouldn't be, a, um, in addition to police, you would have someone who's this specialized. So, you know, longer, so, so I'll leave my question there because it, you know, I see that you also have me medical calls that you go out with the ambulance and it's similar. It's, it, it's a, it's not traffic. It's That's not, right. you know, it's not the, the longer list. So thank you. Um, I'll, I'll stop. <laughs> um, I'll just ask one quick follow up on that and then I'm going to go to Pat uh, is the next person, but uh, Chief, is it still standard practice on domestic violence calls to send out two officers at a time? That's correct. It is. Um, more and more of the calls that we respond to are requiring multiple officer responses, but domestic violence is one that for many, many years has, has necessitated a two officer, at least two officer response um, for a host of reasons, and I could go on for a half an hour about that, but Yes, that is a two officer, minimum two officer response to a domestic violence call. Okay, I might return to it later, but I wanted to uh, proceed to others on the committee and the council. Um, Pat, you was very patient. Yes, um, I have a, a combined question about uh, the FY21 objectives. 
Uh, one of them is to work with town staff and community outreach members to complete a review of department-wide rules and regulations, policies, and procedures. And then at the bottom, you have continued to maintain our best practices as outlined by President Obama's task force on 21st century policing. And one of those, I, mean, I looked that up and it's an ama amazing document, although a lot of it is questionable, but uh, it, to, um, recommendation 2.6 is law enforcement agencies should be encouraged to collect maintain and analyze demographic data on all detentions, stops, frisks, searches, summonses, and arrests. Is that happening? Can you clarify for us how the community is involved and also what practices are you implementing from that, uh, from Obama's uh, task force or, and what are you leaving out and why? Yeah, so uh, specific to the President Obama's task force, we do follow that, uh, the recommendations that were implemented in that. Most of all those. Of uh, yeah, all of them. So you uh, have a citizens review committee? We don't have a citizens review committee specific, but I mean, I'm going specifically with the, what can the five, what are the five things that a police agency can do? So we follow those as far as the transparency, uh, and data collection. What we're trying to establish now, and Captain Ting is working on that, we've always collected racial profiling data on motor vehicle stops. So we're trying to break that down even further to, to, for the arrest numbers and inter, inter, any interactions that we have with the public that may result in um, not only just traffic stops, but uh, any, any you know, call volumes that we will respond to at all. So it's complicated with our community, uh, with our CAD dispatch system on trying to break down those actual numbers. You know, the traffic citations are easy to do. Um, it's less easy for uh, responding to just general calls because we don't always ask for a person to identify, you know, and we don't want to guess about some, somebody's um, ethnicity or that sort of thing. So those, it's a little bit more complicated in tracking those types of numbers. And what about arrests? Arrests, again, that's something that we can do, but it's hard to do because we don't necessarily always uh, have accurate information about individuals that we're arresting because we don't specifically always ask them what their nationality is. And they don't always want to give it. So basically you kind of follow certain elements of the uh, plant 21st century policing, but you modify them as you see fit. I know in terms of undocumented community, we've asked the department not to, uh, as a sanctuary city, to ask uh, for um, proof of residency and things like that. So that's a way of modifying. So I'm not trying to imply that all modifications would be negative, but- No, and I agree with that. I mean, it's just, it's not something that we've always done in the past as far as a general booking process if somebody gets arrested. Uh, it is something that we do because it's mandated for traffic violations. So it's kind so of- a, the, So how do you wed, I'm sorry if I'm taking up too much time, no, but how do you wed that to transparency and communication with the community that feels like it, in Amherst, that feels like it's being targeted um, and and you have you can't show that they are, or we can't show that they aren't, or yeah. you know. Um, you know, those are areas I think we're going to need to have communication from the public about because it's not as simple as asking somebody, okay, what do you identify as as a nationality and or race? Because sometimes they just don't want to tell us, and that happens with traffic stops as well. Um, you know, we have people where an officer will write a citation and an officer will write down black male and he'll say, I'm not a black male. So, you know, it's, it's not as always as accurate as we would like it to be, but we try and make it as accurate as we can make it be. Thank you. You're welcome. Uh, um, I just want to uh, point out that we want to try and stick as close to budget as we can uh, on questions. And, and, uh, uh, other people brought up objectives. Yeah. So I, I, I know, I know, I appreciate that. So, 
It's a I little think, tricky question. I'm looking, actually, I was doing this more to get guidance from the council president as to whether she has any advice for us on the subject and what she envisions for um, a different meeting. Uh, let me just say that the police uh, working with the town manager are in the process of preparing a very comprehensive presentation that will address many of these issues on Monday. To the extent possible, I would like us to stay on the budget today uh, because we do have a full council meeting where um, Chief Livingstone and his other uh, fellow and, and fellow I will and say, And I will say I was not the first person to bring up questions about objectives. In fact, I didn't, I waited, and I feel uncomfortable that we're being told to stop. Yeah, no, I appreciate that. And I think that the problem that I'm trying to get at today is that we have a lot of territory to cover on budget issues. And I, I'm not picking on anyone for having started the conversation. It was a good conversation to begin, but I don't want to um, end up losing our time to get to the fire department and EMS budget and uh, really complete budget questions. And so, um, I was, that, that's why I did that. And I apologize if it was misunderstood. Um, but um, if there are additional um, questions that come along um, that seem that they should be asked today, please do. Um, I'm looking at hands up and I see uh, Mandy and then Bob Hegner, Mandy Haneke and then Bob Hegner. Mandy? Thank you. Um, I, I have also been having a hard time distinguishing between the two. Um, so I'm going to try and save some of my questions for Monday um, that might not be as related directly to next year's budget versus potentially future year's budgets beyond that. But I, I do have a question and, and I'm going to try to ask some others that are more directly related to budget. Uh, one of your long range objectives is the need for traffic officers. Um, and I'm wondering whether in alternatives to that need for additional potentially hires, um, dedicated officer or officers, um, which may require additional hires, um, have been all looked at, you know, have we looked at expanding our parking and parking enforcement to other areas? Uh, have we looked at reassigning you know, this goes to sort of some of those objectives, reassigning calls that might not be traditionally thought of as properly in the police department, but are now handled by the police department to non-police officers, um, whether that's quality of life or um, drug uh, and opioid issues or animal calls. Um, or have we looked at technology solutions, red light cameras and other things like that that address some of those traffic issues, speeding, um, and everything, but don't require hiring um, or dedicating individuals to that role. So that's one of my questions about traffic enforcement in general. Um, and then I would like you to talk about the size of the police department as it relates to the size of our community, what standard practice is. Um, you know, we have a community of about 40,000 residents, but we also have two other um, bonded police departments in our community that are contracted essentially to patrol approximately 15,000 of those 40,000 residents with ACPD patrolling everyone on campus of Amherst College and UMass PD patrolling, you could consider it 13,000 or so beds that are on UMass campus in terms of populations. Um, so I don't know how to look at that with what a APD covers versus ACPD and UMass PD. Um, but what, what is a standard size for a department um, and is some of that related to maybe how much this department covers that might not be traditionally considered police calls? So yeah, a lot of information and I'll try and get it all, or a lot of questions, I'll try and get, hit it all, Mandy. Uh, as far as traffic enforcement, so we don't have a dedicated um, traffic safety officer group we used to and it consisted of two officers whose sole responsibility was to go out and basically do traffic enforcement and write tickets. So officers who are on regular patrol or responding to calls are responsible during the course of their 
patrol shifts to find the neighborhoods where we're receiving complaints and run radar, that sort of thing, stop traffic for uh, stop signs and red light violations. Um, so that's the expectation there. Uh, as far as red light cameras and that sort of thing, uh, that's against the law currently. It would need to be a legislative change. Well, you know, that is not something we're allowed to do. Um, so, you know, we don't have the ability to do that in the state of Massachusetts yet. So um, that covers the traffic enforcement part. As far as um, standards for police officer or for police agency sizes, there was a, there is a national recommendation based on population and call volume. Um, we brought that up in a, probably right around when I became police chief 10 years ago about where we should be. All of the standards that we looked at, we, we are smaller than we should be. Um, and in comparison, you know, you mentioned the University Police Department, they're budgeted at 62 police officers. Northampton is budgeted at 60 police officers. We're busier than both of those agencies. Even with the reduction in um, the, the most recent reduction in Northampton Police Department's budget of, I think, $600,000, they're still budgeted at 55 officers now. You know, we're budgeted at 48. So um, from a size perspective, I would, you know, I would argue that we're probably less than we should be, but we've made, I think, done a really good job with the resources that we've had in the policing that we've done. Uh, Amherst College pretty much stays, they are, um, it's a different process that they go through for um, on-campus officers as far as what they're allowed to do off-campus. Um, you know, the training is different. Um, not to say that they haven't assisted us and vice versa. The University of Massachusetts Police Department is pretty exclusively staying on campus. Um, you know, typically, when we're at our busiest, whether it's September, October, March, April, and May, it's when they're the busiest. We certainly help each other out for calls when times are, you know, when it's necessary or needed. But um, we've had experimentations with mutual patrols and that sort of thing, and they haven't always worked out. So, can, can I follow up? You know, you say NoHo's budgeted at 55. Mm. Uh, officers and right. we're similarly sized to Northampton, but that includes, um, you know, all of the residents of the UMass campus and the Amherst College campuses that have their own police department. So I guess that was part of my question was, if we, you know, I'm generally not a fan of removing students from calculations, but but there are essentially three police departments that are patrolling sectors of town um, with UMass patrolling UMass campus. I don't think APD generally patrols that. So if we remove those individuals from the calculation, what would our national recommended recommended size be for a population that's about, you know, that 25,000? And, and I guess that, that the counter of that is call volume is separate from population. And do, does our call, call volume match our population in that instance, um, I guess would be another question. You know, for comparisons, as far as call volume, um, you know, on UMass's end, I don't know what their call volume looks like. Obviously in the summertime, it's gonna be re significantly reduced. Um, and because we restrict our officers time off, um, we don't allow officers to take vacation time, typically on Thursday, Fridays and Saturdays in September, October. November, April, and May. So our officers take a lot of time off in the summertime. Um, so it kind of matches the fact that we are, have a reduction in call volume and fewer officers working in the summertime because we wouldn't replace for overtime, that sort of thing. You know, going back to, you know, 10 years ago when we did the national federal standard, we were supposed to be, um, and it was based on call volume population I'm trying to remember what else, uh, geographical size, that sort of thing. You know, the recommendation that was that we would have been, I think 55 officers is where Amherst would have been. Um, you know, for many, many years, we've looked at mechanisms or ways to try and get both the university police department to work mutual patrols with us and it just hasn't worked out. So. Okay. 
So uh, anything else, Mandy? If not, I'll see Bob Hegner. No, I, I'm good for now. Bob? Yeah, I, I, I had a question about trends in call volume. If I look at the chart on or the table on page 52, yep. in FY15 and 16, the volume was roughly 15,000 calls. Then 17, 18, 19, the, the volume jumps about 16%. And is that a trend that's continuing? Um, and at some point, is that going to put any stress on the, the, the number of, or put it, you know, increase the need for the number of officers? I, the, I can tell you that the trends kind of fluctuate. Um, we've been as high as 21,000 calls for, in one year, but the, the trends currently in the 14 to 17,000 range seems to be the most consistent that we've seen. Um, you know, I look at things like arrest numbers that are way down and I specifically believe and we believe just based on the conversations we've had with our outreach officers that it's really comes down to the community outreach that we're doing, why those numbers are down so significantly, specifically arrest numbers for quality of life calls, you know, minors in position of alcohol, student related type calls are way down. And um, we really believe that that's a direct result of the campus and community coalition and our community outreach and sector based officers, um, the work that they're doing. So, you know, numbers change every year. Um, but the areas of concentration that we've worked really hard at are the one numbers that are going down and that those are the ones that we're most proud of right now. Um, the ones that you see going up, yeah, they are mental health calls and calls related to the homelessness and that sort of thing. Um, and so that's an area that we're starting to concentrate more on. Okay, thank you. You're welcome. Looking to see if there are any other questions. I don't see any right now. Chief, I just had one follow up a little bit. Uh, what Mandy started. And, uh, are there periods of time when you find it particularly difficult to arrange the staffing to get the number of officers available and on the street that you think should be there? Is that a uh, not an existent problem, occasional, frequent? How do you, what would you say? Uh, I mean, we try and, you know, in the process of recruitment, we try and educate the recruits as best that we can that look, you're coming into an environment where we're a very busy police agency, but our expectations are high as are the community's expectations of our officers. So, you know, we kind of try and prep them for the fact that it's a busy agency. There's an expectation that you'll be available for overtime because we do hire a lot of officers on overtime during the, the school years. Um, to, you know, make up for officers who may not be, you know, the, the numbers just aren't there. So, you know, on, you know, our weekends typically start on Thursdays. So Thursday, Friday, Saturdays, and now even Sundays, you know, we find ourselves having to hire extra officers to, you know, deal with call volumes or just, you know, calls in general, because it's, it seems like the types of calls we're responding to now are a requiring more officer responses and then they're taking longer to deal with them. So, you know, the dynamics of the policing has changed. Um, so those are the types of things we're seeing. Thank you. You know, a typical arrest used to be, it used to take 15 or 20 minutes to book and do a report. Now it's over an hour, hour and a half to, to accomplish that same task um, because the laws are just more complicated. So. Little things like that. So if an officer makes an arrest, he's essentially off the street for well over an hour and it didn't used to be the case. Okay. Um, I see Mary Lou has a question. I have two. Uh, in the past, you um, there were concerns about the shelter and in winter shelter at the Baptist Church and a, it seemed to be a, a, a many calls there. Has that improved? That's the first question. And the second question is that the uh, people who say they, when you ask them their address, they say the streets of Amherst. And we know that there were issues not only on the streets, but around the library. And I wonder if that uh, 
that group of people are increasing or decreasing, and how much impact does that have on the department? Sure. So specific to the shelter, the Craig's Door shelter, um, the call volume to that shelter is, I wouldn't say it's a lot, it's consistent, but we also have officers who are liaisons to the shelter who work directly with not only the staff, but they're very familiar with the clientele. So they, we have a pretty good working relationship and working rapport with the Craig's Door shelter people. So I wouldn't say the call volume has increased over the years, but it's consistent, uh, probably both for police and fire. As far as the community, uh, the homeless community downtown, that also is relatively consistent. Um, you know, when the shelter does close, it becomes a different set of problems because they're finding places to sleep that we wouldn't necessarily want them to find to sleep. That was one of the reasons we initiated the downtown patrol officer, um, Officer Nagel, was to deal specifically with issues related around the, the library, um, you know, sometimes town hall they would be in or, or other areas. Um, so, you know, that, that there was a very specific reason and it was related to those types of calls um, that we had the out, outreach officer in downtown. Thank you. You're welcome. Kathy? You talked about overtime, and one of my questions was um, using COVID experience, um, which we hopefully won't have the same kind of experience over time, but being able to quantify the extent to which your overtime either went down or shifted. And I'm, I'm partly thinking about this, I know Paul is listening also, is that when we are in negotiations with UMass on what money they're paying back to the town. Right. This gives us, we can document some of that seasonality of the change in the mix um, that was would have would have been your typical March, April, May, um, and however that happened. So I'm, I would I would imagine either the budget for overtime was down or it shifted during those months and that you've already computed that in. You've already put it into next year's budget in terms of what you're expecting in the first half of the year. But just going back and doing some analysis of that to be able to be using on what are the nature of those calls that, that produce overtime, you know, that we can't handle with regular staff. Yeah, so, uh, yeah, and for overtime in the normal school year, you're right. Um, the majority of that is for vacation and sick replacement, but then additional officers when we're at our busiest, which is September, October, and November, and then March, April, and May. Um, there was savings this year in our overtime budget because of the, the C-19, um, you know, spring break when the students didn't return. It wasn't necessary for us to have as many officers available. Um, so there, there's savings there. And I think, um, you know, the fact that we weren't at maximum um, number of officers, there'll be some savings there as well in our um, full-time line item budget. But we'll, I guess we'll see where this fall takes us. Um, I know we have concerns. Um, we don't know. We had a meeting earlier today with UMass, a Zoom meeting. I don't think anybody quite knows what to expect for this fall as far as, you know, where we're going to be as an agency and what we're going to need for staffing levels. Um, I guess time will tell on that. But, you know, any monies that we, and I, I know you all know this, but any monies that we don't use gets returned to the general fund. Right. Yeah. No, I, I know you're not sitting there with an, a nice purse sitting on no, your table. No. No. So, okay, uh, thank you. You're welcome. I just think it's an opportunity to document, um, you know, I'm going to say the same thing with ambulance and EMS, you know, where before we could show seasonality, but this will really show it in, yeah. in a different way. Um, we, we can, we certainly track, okay, how much are we spending in our overtime budget on vacation replacement? How much are we, you know, using on sick replacement? And then how much are we using for what we call extra help? when we're assigning officers just to have extra bodies around at our peak times. But we definitely document that. Okay, thank you. 
I don't see any more hands up as uh, for the police. I'm going to just uh, give a second to see if there are any other counselors or members of the committee who wish to ask additional questions about the police budget. And if not, um, gone in some order to just briefly touch on communications and animal welfare. And seeing none, I guess, Chief, we can go on to the other two segments of the budget that relate to your supervision. Sure, so just the communication center. Uh, we have full 12 full-time employees in the communication center. That's been pretty consistent um, for many, many years. Um, we, one of those positions is paid for through the state E911 grant. Um, that's been uh, a pretty standard practice that we've had over the years as well. We receive additional grant funding for training for our, our um, all of our dispatchers. They are mandated annually at 16 hours of training and that usually involves dealing with mental health problems, first aid, you know, being able to talk people through you know, EMT issues, whether it be CPR, that sort of thing. Um, uh, we have an extremely professional communications group led by Mike Curtin. Um, you know, one of the questions, and I know we've already discussed it earlier, is trying to enhance or enlarge the possibility of a regional approach to communications. We've had difficulty over the years and continue to have difficulty finding partners to do that. Um, there's a reluctance in, of communities just to, who don't want to give up their, um, their communication center, whether it's a small town like Granby, Belcher Town, and Hadley. And so those are the three communicate, those are the three towns most recently we've had communication with about seeing if there's an interest in going to a regional um, system. But um, other than that, their, their, um, their budget again is similar to the police and that 95%, 96% of it involves personnel and then overtime replacement and that sort of thing. But um, I'll entertain any questions if anybody has anything specific. Are there any questions about communications? Um, Andy. Yes, thank you. A couple related to funding. Um, and I think some of this has already been answered, but we do communications for Pelham, Leverett, and Shootsbury. Uh, so I'm guessing and assuming, but please confirm that they actually contribute to the cost of our dispatch and, and the funding for that. Um, and does our designation of a, as a regional hazmat dispatch center come with funding from the state? Um, and then the last one is the 911 call volume this year was fairly decreased, you know, showed a significant decrease. Uh, is that because, w is it directly related to the loss of Hadley EMS through our dispatch? So uh, when you're talking about the first part of the question, Mandy, for um, who we who we dispatch for regionally, um, Pelham, Leverett, and Shrewsbury, I, we only dispatch regionally for fire, not for police on that. So, um, and I think Hadley's out of that loop as well, and I would Prefer to Tim Nelson on that specifically. The um, E911 calls received, that's in transition. Um, and I should have brought Mike Curtin down to explain that, but um, they're going to a geographical location for E911 or for uh, 911 calls. And a lot of it has to do with cell phones and where you are geographically on that. So there's a reduction there because, for instance, if you're on the UMass campus now, it would go to the UMass um, Police Department as a check off for, for the number of calls we get. So that, that there's some variations there about geographically where people are calling from on cell phones and that sort of thing. Thank you. Did I answer everything? Yep. Okay. They're probably, they're probably gonna wanna come back. Okay, uh, Kathy. But in, I saw in the part that was called challenges, um, you use the word staff morale and turnover. Has it been difficult to retain people? Um, is there something, is this like a one year or has that been long going? And then on morale, um, so just a little bit about what that is. Um, yeah, there's been some 
pretty significant turnover in the communication center over the last couple of years. Um, you know, it's a stressful job. There's no question about it. And the town manager sits in on those from time to time. So we have had turnover recently. Um, and it's, a rel it's similar to policing in that it's a long process to get a replacement because there's training that's involved. There's mandated training that's involved. So, you know, the process of hiring a dispatch can be as long as six to nine months to get somebody who a goes through the interview process, then goes through the training, and then they have to go through a field training, you know, time because you just there's a lot to know up there, and so and it's again you're working, you know, the same schedule that police officers are midnight to eight, four to twelve, so it's shift work involved, it's weekends, it's holidays, it's not a profession that a lot of people can deal with, so there is significant turnover in communication center. There's no doubt about it. So that you would call that. It's not just a, it's a long-term problem in that it's going to be a re, recur, it sounds like you're saying it's a recurring problem too. It's not like you can see an, a way to fix it or. Um, well, you, I, yeah, yeah, I would agree with that. Uh, the way I see to fix it is to try and get a regional, regional approach to it because you'd be reducing the number of PSAPs communication center and you'd have more people to draw from. Um, we're trying to get the state to change the mechanism of what they require for communication center. If they did something as simple as mandate two dispatchers at a time in every communication center, it would fix a lot of the problems. But that's at the state level and we haven't been successful at getting that accomplished. Okay, thank you. So, uh, Dorothy, did you have something? Uh, one is a, I have two questions, but one's a quick follow up to that. Um, would an increased salary make the job more desirable? I mean, people are funny. Sometimes people take a really rough job and do it, but if the salary is really good, have they considered increasing the salary? Um, <laughs> where's the town manager? I need him to chime in here, but um, yeah, I'm sure that would be the first thing they would say, but um, I pretty, I know our, I know our, Communication salaries are competitive, but I don't know um, in comparison to towns around here where they stand. So, um, yeah. if, you know, if you can't keep somebody in the job, then it's costing you more because of the training and the whatever, and it's cheaper to get somebody who stays. Yeah, I'll probably get a phone call from a communication center employee about five minutes after this ends and wants to know why I didn't go to bat for him. But, um, you know, those are conversations that, you know, I have specifically with Mike Curtin and, you know, talking about keeping our salaries competitive to area dispatch centers, you know, Northampton being the closest one in our size. And I, you know, want to make sure that we stay equal to them, that sort of thing. Okay, and, and my second question, if we're going to have a separate discussion on fire, but if I don't know why um, active shooter training is in the fire department, EMS budget and not in the police department budget. So if it's going to, if we're going to be, if that's going to be dealt with later, fine, I'll wait. But that was one of my questions. I'm not sure why that's in their budget, um, except for the fact that we use tactical EMTs as part of our training for active shooters. So I don't know if there's a crossover there. Um, I didn't really, I'll be honest with you, I didn't really look at the fire budget, but um, we do use tactical EMTs as part of our active shooter training. So I don't know if that's incorporated in there. No, so that does that mean, does a tactical EMT mean an EMT with a gun? It, it certainly means they're trained in how to use a gun, but they okay. wouldn't be carrying a gun. Okay, because that's one of our big issues and topics right now. So. Okay. Thank you. Um, so I don't see any other hands up in the you just want to say one a few words about uh, animal welfare? Um, no, I don't want to say a word about Carol Hepburn, but um, <laughs> anyways, uh, yeah, Carol's, you know, budget is her budget. She's responsible for not only responding, responding to all sorts of animal complaints over the course of the year, but she inspects all of our farms and, and, and I'd say this every year, she responds to more things than I would like her to be responding to because she can't say no to anybody. But again, Carol's budget is 90% of it is her salary. And then, you know, gasoline and some other supplies as far as making this, the kennel 
the kennel run properly, which she does an outstanding job with. You know, I wish I had 20 carols in this building. Um, she just does an outstanding job. You, you can actually see her service levels, you know, don't change dramatically, but for one person, she's always very, very busy. You know, she's responding on weekends. She's responding at night, even though I tell her not to. And, um, you know, she just does an outstanding job. I can't say enough good things. The cops love her. I know the community loves her. Um, and I'll just leave it at that and answer any questions I can. I'm looking to see if there are any questions. Uh, Mary Lou, you had something? Uh, yes, I just, uh, a few years ago, we had space in the animal uh, shelter and we, I believe we rented some space to Northampton. Mm -hmm. And then I wondered if we have, if we still have space that we rent to other towns and what the fee would be. Yes, yeah, so we have a regional shelter um, currently Northampton, the city of Northampton uses our shelter for stray animals and the town of Hadley uses it as well. They do, they pay a, an annual fee, which is not very much, but we are um, proposing to increase that this, this year. And then um, we charge per dog per number of days that they're there. So there's there's two two separate fees to use the kennel. And um, so it's an annual fee and then there's a uh, daily fee to house the dog there. Okay, thank you. You're welcome. Mandy. Yeah, um, I don't know whether, Chief, you can answer these, um, but one of them's about leash law compliance. There was a, a item in here, whether, I don't know whether it was the objective or the challenge, it was the challenge. Um, Town on Properties Leash Law Compliance is the only person that does that, uh, Carol, our animal welfare officer. Um, and what are we looking at for helping that compliance as we open a dog park in the next year, where now we'll be able to hopefully send people to the dog park instead of violating the leash laws in the local conservation areas on the off leash, on the, when off leash is not permitted yeah. on those properties um, to make them more friendly for those that don't want to be hiking with off-leash dogs. And then the second one is who responds for things like, you know, we read the bulletin blogs, um, call blogs and police logs, and we get a lot of farm animals in the roads and those types of calls, a moose in a backyard or something or a bear in the backyard. Who is in charge of responding for that? And what are your thoughts on if, you know, where that response should be. Um, so those are my questions. Yeah, so um, the leash law part um, is probably one area that drives Carol more crazy than anything. She is the sole person who's responsible while both licensing dogs every year. And I think she's at around 90% compliance on that. But yeah, the majority of the calls for violations of people on, you know, not adhering to the leash law and it usually occurs at our hiking trails uh, those unless carol's not working a police officer would respond to that complaint but she certainly carries the brunt of that probably 90 percent of the calls it's one person who's responsible for that and I, and i know that's an area that drives her a little bit crazy um trying to um trying to deal with all of the calls that she gets about that uh, we do anticipate once the dog park opens that that will help um, with the leash law calls that she gets. I know she was talking about it just recently that also the majority of the violations occur from people who are not from Amherst. So they'll come in, Amethyst Brook is a big area, Mill River Rec area is a big area of complaints. Upper's Pond in the warm weather um, those are all hot spots for people who just want to let their dogs run free and run in the streams and stuff of that nature. And it's a constant source of frustration for Carol. So as far as animal calls, typically those would be funneled through the police department. So yeah, if some, if there's a bear in my backyard or there's loose cows in the street. We respond initially, but usually Carol gets involved because she knows pretty much everybody who owns everything in town. If it's a, a farm animal, she she's a, a source of unbelievable knowledge. And then um, she also has good rapport with our environmental police officers who would come out for a moose type call or a, a bear call, that sort of thing. So those are who those calls would typically go to. Okay, thank you. 
Thank you. You're welcome. So I don't see any more hands up. I want to thank you, uh, Chief Livingstone and uh, your staff. And I uh, really appreciate the presentation that you've made. And it was um, a really good discussion, very informative. And I think that helped all of us on the committee and the additional counselors present to um, get an understanding of the budget and the relationship between budget and goals and the challenges. So, Thank you for what you do every day and thank you for your presentation today. Thank you all and thank you, Andy, and I'll talk thank to you. you. See you on Monday. Okay. So with that, uh, I'm going to thank our uh, fire department for having volunteered to be second but in the, and then to actually stay with us. Uh, and I assume that uh, Chief Nelson, that you're going to um, start with uh, the presentation. Sure. Uh, but uh, welcome, please. Hi, how you doing? Uh, Scott, Scott, Scotty owes, owes me. I think I think he's got got, got a golf golf game game he's going to. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, <laughs> so I've got um, this is Assistant Chief uh, Strong Strong and Assistant Chief uh, Ohm, Ohm's that here here as well. So just, just want, to, want, to, want to know, know that. So. Uh, for us, uh, same same as you know, Scotty. Not not you know we've uh, you know I won't go go into a lot. I think this this is more 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 about uh, answering questions that, that you may may have. But just to go go through it, our, our mission mission state 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 statement is the same as it's been the for the past 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 few years. We think that in kind of encompasses really what what the, what we do we do here. Um, uh, for the kind of, kind of, kind of accomplishments, uh, just kind of, well, I hit a couple of the high, the high lights. Uh, one, one big, big thing is that we've, uh, we're requiring portable ray, ray, radios for all of our fire, for firefighters. That's a, a national stand, stand, standard, and and we've been using uh, grant grant money and that type type of thing, we think to uh, acquire acquire those. Uh, partnership with uh, you, you, UMass to add staff on on our busy week, week, week weekends. Uh, that that has remained successful. Uh, I I would be skeptical 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 to think that that might that that, that would continue in, into into this new new year uh, for obvious obvious reasons. Um, one of our big big. One of the big, big things we're proud, proud of, of course, is our, uh, our our student fire fire safety safety pro, pro, pro program. Again, 20, 24 years uh, of, of, success, of success there. And what I and, and what I've said in the in the past, when I when I when I was at uh, at Holy Hol 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 Fire, uh, and, and Amherst was the pro program that everybody want want to be like. That that is that uh, the Amber, 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 Amherst has set set the, the standards the standard throughout throughout the state for the safe for program and still still does. Uh, and the other thing is we 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 do do our best best to beat beat the bushes for uh, grant grant for uh, grant grant funds and that that type type of thing to get uh, to get to get needed needed equipment and specialized equipment. Uh, heading down down to our ch 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 challenges uh, again for us our big big thing is this, uh, the staff, the staffing we're you know we're uh, as as you may may have read in, in our staffing so study from 2017 you know we uh, we're we're not we're not where 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 we should should be uh, it, uh, by through through the study and by the, now, the national standards for our for our size size population and call call all 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 volume. Uh, the other thing, as you know, uh, the ongoing saga, saga of replacing this this build, build, building. Uh, again, it's a 90 year 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 old facility, and our North State Station is 40, 45 years old. So that's a, that's a try, and and that's that's a, that that's one of one of our big expenses each each year is maintaining maintaining both 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 buildings in a somewhat livable live, 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 livable condition. Because we're we're here 20 to 24 four hours a day, seven seven days a week, 365 days a year. So. Uh, the, the, the other challenge, challenge, challenge of course, are our vehicle maintenance. Uh, they 
they they run some hard miles, uh, and uh, and that and that's an, and that and that's an, 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 an expense. One one thing where where we're lucky and for, for fortunate, I guess, is that we. Uh, we, we we have we have have, have a group group a group of fire fire firefighters that main, main maintain most if not all of our equipment uh, just right up right right up to the point of major main 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 that's when uh, there are there are some some things that we just have have to either bring some some someone in or send the uh, the equipment out but they've done a lot over the years to save the town money in terms in terms of the work the work they do. So. Um, uh, our calls, you know, our, call, our calls are, uh, you know, well, we, we lost, lost calls, of course, because of you know, we lost uh, Hadley. But, uh, but as, as I mentioned here, I mean, we, we lost, uh, you know, we moved, moved to 20% of our, of our, our, our either the EMS response or responses, but the rest, the rest of our response area is in, is, is in, is in the inquiry. Increasing. Most most of it is right here in town, uh, Amherst. So, uh, long long range objectives pretty clear. Uh, we want to want to keep work, working on on a new new head head quarters. Work working on a plan plan for the north north phase phase station. As I said, it's 45 years old. And some, some something that's kind of coming down down the road that has that has come out come out quite a bit bit now of late is just the uh, community pair 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 medicine sort of the the EMS making making house calls to reduce the number the number the number of visits to any more emergency room. So uh, our twenty objectives uh, well and up an update on those. Uh, we we have we have applied 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 for an uh, uh, assistant for fire for fire for fighters grant uh, for, to seek fund funding for more for, for, for personnel as was re recommended in the staffing study. Uh, we we we're continuing our, our our work on a rescue ta task force that that goes along with the active shooter training. training. Uh, we, we did a we did a comprehensive emergency management drill uh, earlier this this year, and we're we're work, work, uh, last, last year I'm sorry, and we're we're work, working on just lessons learned learn learn from 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 that, uh, and well kind of accomplished uh, one is that is uh, we 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 kind of figured out just how much of an in the in in the impact the loss had 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 the had, 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 had had on, on it, and I think at the time we said it, it would take us about five years to get back to where we were, where um, when when we lost lost had had heavily in terms of our activity. But that we we've been look, looking at that, and we think it, it'll be more more in the three three and a half to four four year time time span. Uh, so and for objectives for, uh, for for the coming year, coming come, come, come year, as I mentioned, we've added uh, we've 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 applied, applied for grant grant grants for staff staff staffing equipment and train train training. Uh, again, going back to to the staffing so the study, we're looking. You know, we we want we want want to into, into, in, in, implement some some of the uh, facets of that. And just in the last year. State has adopted the federal OSHA standards, standards that apply across across the board to municipalities, and we're work, we're working on a plan to uh, come into compliance with that. And uh, one one of the, I guess, uh, surprising things, or is, is that the state is will is willing to help. They uh, they're they're from from the government and they're here here to help. They they really want folks folks to come into compliance with plans. And with, with that, they're 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 willing to advise and assist uh, municipalities to reach to reach uh, to reach reach the reach the, uh, a point point where where they they are are in compliance with those OSHA regs, and to the point where they'll they'll come come in do audits do safety audits and um, and, and assist uh, municipalities to come up with a plan to to reach 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 those benchmarks if you will. So with that, uh, 
I think that I'll, I'll end it, end it, we we will end it, end it, entertain any quote, 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 quote questions you might have. And uh, well, I'll, I'll 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 wait 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 till we get in again. I wanted I wanted to make, make sure I clear, 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 clarified the the, 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 uh, the dispatch question that came came up. So with that, okay. Well, thank you, Chief. Uh, Pat, uh, you had your hand up, and uh, I know you've been thinking about some of the issues. Um, I uh, want to thank everybody in the department in the firehouse for doing so much maintenance on vehicles, et cetera. You save us obviously an enormous amount of money. Um, so, but I do have some questions. Um, sure. Sure. The operating expenses are level funded and the capital outlay is also level funded. Right. Um, and I'm concerned in two ways. Uh, one, I'd like to have a sense of what the small equipment is that makes up the uh, capital outlay. And also I'd like to have a sense of you live there, all of you, and what impending doom. We have a habit of not maintaining buildings, as you've mentioned. And what should we be looking at really to think about and anticipate? You know, we're talking about the police department roof. What about your roof? What about uh, that's not been budgeted, that's not been looked at? Right. Right. For us, I mean, uh, I'll start start with the uh, so second question. Question first is, you know, the fact that this is they're they're both old build, build, build buildings. So every day we're working on some something. I mean, they're you know they're they're draft 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 drafty, cold in in the in the in the winter, hot in in the summer time. We just repaired. Uh, in the last six months, we just just repaired a ceiling in our uh, on our side of the second floor. That that came came about because we had a leak in in the in, in the roof that we worked its way through, and that that was a that that was an expense we did not anticipate. So, and it's that kind 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 of thing, day to day main, main, main maintenance of a build the building that was that was put up nine, 90 years years ago. It's tough to be fuel, 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 fuel efficient. Tough to be energy efficient with a building like, like, like that. There's, there's the other, the other, there's um, <coughs> excuse me. Uh, the other, the, another, another, another piece, piece is that we, the air we breathe here is the air we breathe, breathe here. There's no, no fill, fill trade, 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 trade. We don't have an H, an H, an H, an H of access system. Our heating, venting, vent, vent, ventilation, and cool, 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 cooling is we we have air air conditioners in in, in the in the window, the window. So and and that and that type type type, type thing, uh, you know. And uh, North North stays 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 station. It's for 45, five, five year 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 years old. It's in better shape, but it's still a 45 year old build 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 building. It's just con 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 content maintenance. We we need we need we need need to, to replace some car car carpets. We need to we need to uh, replace some of the other I, 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 I items throughout throughout the build build, build building there. Uh, I I would ask uh, Chief Charles Strongman to weigh 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 in because he he is our our operations. So he's got an <coughs> intimate knowledge knowledge of the needs of both both of these build buildings. Lindsay. There we go. Yeah, I mean, I think you've hit on the key points. Um, you know, we're not right now talking about, you know, just the needs of the building in terms of size and layout for a modern fire department. That's a separate from your question. Yeah. And most stations in particular, the central are lacking that. But just in terms of maintenance, um, you know, sort of the critical infrastructure of the building, you mentioned the roofs. Uh, right now, we're in pretty good shape there. Fortunately, central station is about 10 years old, although as the chief said, we had a problem. North Station, I want to say is about 15 years old, the roof. Uh, both are in reasonably good shape. Um, we've had failures of the main heating system in both buildings in the last three to four years, and those have been replaced under emergency procurement. Uh, not the way we like to do business, but uh, that's the way it goes. Unfortunately, things like that break, they have to be replaced immediately. Um, so in terms of roofs and heating, we've actually accomplished those. Um, it's a lot of other little things that come up. Central Station, uh, you know, the plaster is coming down, the ceiling and the walls in many places constantly. It's beyond patching. 
um, a uh, few ceiling leaks, the North Station, um, electrical issues at both buildings. So it's a lot of little things. Um, Central Station right now, the DPW is about to deal with some caving in in the parking lot due to some drainage problems there. So it, it's lots of uh, little things like that that we you know patch as they as they come up. Um, it's hard to anticipate you know what might fail next. Um, other than to say, we have taken care of the roofs and the heating system relatively recently. Can I ask a clarification of uh, uh, finance, either Sean or Paul? What kind of uh, plan in the budget, what kind of preparation are you making financially for these kinds of ongoing minor collapses or repair needs? Because I, I don't see it, and I'm curious. So I can weigh in first, Paul. Um, so I sent an email out earlier this week just to all the department heads, letting them know if there are any urgent capital expenditures that come up to reach out to us. Um, the capital improvement program did include some funds for that. So there is a pot of funding that if, if it's an urgent need and it's a, um, something that's safety related or you know preserving the building, that there are funds available for it. <clears throat> Uh, 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 well, she she had asked asked she had asked me about the CAC. Uh, she has asked me specifically about a CAC, uh, our CAC, 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 CAC capital needs, or is that is that it? I, I'm trying to figure out how you are whether we've planned to do the again quote unquote small fixes that are keeping. Uh, the roof from leaking, et cetera. What's the contingency? You're, how much do we have in reserves? How do how how can you uh, put so much emphasis on? Um, <laughs> I guess I'm trying to understand how what kind of plan is is in place to maintain the fire building as it is because I understand the need for building and stuff and make it safe for the men and women who work there because i'm not seeing it and and i i'm sure it's there i'm hoping that it's there what's this pot how much is it um what's the anticipated costs so kathy you have your hand up in your chair of jcpc so i don't know if this your hand was up for this issue but if it is i wanted to get to you next I just was going to build on Pat's question because if I looked at the things we delayed in terms of requests, this list wasn't on it. And I'm wondering whether in the works, um, Lynn mentioned this the other night, that if, if we get to a point where saying we're not going to be building a new fire station for, you know, name the time frame. Um, so what is the list of critical needs, whether it's potable water, uh, uh, air conditioning systems and which which are fixable if we had the budget for it, which are if they fail put you in safety but it's it's that facility kind of a list um, that would be done on both North Station now that you've mentioned it and Central Station that whatever it is when we we add it up we just did something with the library which walk through on systems and then walk through on ADA, on disability, but it just went through big to small. And I'm thinking that we need something like that. And then, um, you know, Sean mentioned we put aside something called a capital reserve, but it may exceed this coming year, but then we should be thinking about, okay, is it FY22 or can some part of it be done in F? And I, I just, I don't think we have that list. And so it's a request for that uh, thoughtful list that's almost an inventory. I think, yeah, so I think, oops. No, go ahead, Tim. Well, for me, you know, part, part of it is that these, the things we need to do uh, they're, you know, so you look at them as separate items, and they don't rise to the level of by by by, by themselves. They don't rise to the level of a capital pro, 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 pro project because we we need we need to replace place the floor. We need we need to fix fix the windows. We need we need we need uh, you know as I said uh, replace place car 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 car, car, 
carpets or carpets. We need to uh, do to work on 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 the ventilation system, things like that. They and in gen, general may 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 maintenance, and that's and that's a case where you know because the build build buildings are all old, you do a lot more of the small small stuff, you know, and it's and it and that adds up. It's it's you know a death a death by a thousand a thousand small small cuts, but but in in the end it adds up. Andy, can I weigh in real quick? Uh, yeah, and then uh, Sean, go ahead. Uh, just two things. So one of the things that um, we started working on a little bit with fire and DPW, but we need to build it out more, which is what you both said, which is a deferred maintenance list. We have a pretty good idea of deferred maintenance at the elementary schools and at the library. And we need to build that list out more for the fire station and um, DPW. We've got the beginnings of it, but we need to really dig into it a little bit more. Um, and the other pot of money that does exist, typically, I, I, have to, I don't have it in front of me, so I'll have to double check. Um, usually there's a facility type capital article that has like a building improvement focus. And it's not always geared towards specific, like a specific building improvement, it's a pot of money because we know there will be building improvement needs that rise, throughout, that come up throughout the year. So we'll have to look at some of the older articles that have been approved and see if there is a building improvement article. Um, that might still still exist. Um, I know the original FY21 plan, that was something we were looking at, but then obviously COVID-19 happened. So um, so there may be some building improvement articles out there that, are, that can be used for some of those smaller capital items. Mm -hmm. uh, Paul, you wanted to say something, go ahead. Uh, just quickly, we have a facilities manager, we can get him involved in this that um, to get, get organize this a little bit better. So um, having spent a fair amount of time on fire facilities in this town, I wanna to just be very clear. There is no way the central fire station can ever be renovated to accommodate what our staff need. So we can fix it, we can glue it, but we can't continue to, for instance, have people endangered by smoke versus opioids, et cetera. It's not okay. That's I've said enough, but I do have some questions. Tim. <laughs> hey, how are you doing? Yeah, I'm fine. How are you doing? I'm well. I'm doing well. I want you to know I haven't forgotten fire. I know. Uh, I know. So call force and student force. How do I look at this budget and see them? Uh, they're right now they're a critical critical part of our uh, of our uh, uh, operation because of the way we're staffed, because of the model that we were using. Using we we depend pin on them as, as as our as our our support support staff. Okay, so and that and that's and that's how and that's how 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 we see 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 them. I, I've said said before, you know what what we run here is a, a rural model of a fire fire department uh, when we're really a small city. Even even if you remove the uh, the three the three uh, well the two two call call colleges and and, and the university we're still the small city so and that, and you know a rural model model is one where you depend on folks come come coming in from off the duty and that and that type 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 of thing to answer call so so that that's where the the call call force and student student force can come in to support for 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 us when when we're Completely, 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 well, full, 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 fully out, just, just flat, 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 flat out. So, where, mean? where do I see them in this budget? Because I don't oh. see line item. Oh, uh, they have, they have a, uh, they have, they have a line, line, line them. The call, the call, call force has one. Uh, Five ten four hundred for the call force. It's the fourth yeah. item down. It just says yeah. call force under uh, bereavement leave. Yeah, it's in. Yeah, it's in the. Uh, Yes, it's, it's they they've all they've always had had a had a had a line 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 item and the uh, the student student force don't 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 per, per se because they're all all they're all they're all all volunteers and any, any expense, expenses we might incur because of them come come out of, out of our uh, our uh, our oper operator rating budget most most of that is our training budget our training line. Okay. And then my other question was. Um, I need to understand a little bit more about what you mean by community paramedicine, okay. especially as you then make the statement how it might impact your activity level, therefore your budget. 
one of, one of the things that's the thing that's that it's a coming thing. It's taking 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 paramedics and send, sending them out on how on how how house calls per 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 se. And this and this is being pushed by insurance companies to reduce the number of visits to to uh, your PCP or 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 a, 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 a hospital. It's sort sort of pro proactive pro, care and using paramedics as the ones to deliver that that care and you know, to check to check to check on folks uh, post post hot 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 hospital visits that is that is that type 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 of thing. Um, uh, Assistant Chief Olmstead has done a lot of work on this. So Jeff, why don't you you weigh weigh in? On? So the community paramedicine uh, format is unfortunately one that's not well funded at this point through the insurance company. So while they're pushing it um, in the Northeast, they haven't really backed it up with funding. You find in other parts of the country, they've been very aggressive about uh, doing that. And, and really what it would mean would be taking one of the medics, maybe two at a time and, and not having them attached to a fire truck or the 911 ambulances. They would be a standalone uh, go out and help folks. And we could develop this into, I mean, we talked a little bit earlier with APD about mental health cases, and we've seen the spike in mental health cases. And I think looking at some national models, that might be a good place for us to be involved with um, the CSOs and other uh, social workers that we're really looking to help people find the resources they need so they don't need emergency services. Uh, for a lot of folks going to the emergency department for mental health cases is not a really good way to give them medical care. It's not the type of medical care they're really needing what they're looking for. So we're looking for a way to develop this, but at some point we have to be able to fund it or get the kind of uh, insurance money that goes with it. There's some Medicare has some pilot projects that are out there looking at, at funding at a, a kind of a lower level, um, mm -hmm. but it's not a sustainable format for us. At this point. Okay. Thank you. That was very helpful to understand. Yeah. One additional thing, just uh, and then I want to get on to Mandy, who's been uh, had her hand up for a long time. But um, when you, you into your first question on page fifty six, under per, there's a big line for personnel services, and then under the box. Um, and where it talks to about major components, it defines personnel services and it puts all personnel services, including the call force together in the single line. And uh, I've had an assumption that there were sub lines in budgets that are used for internal working purposes within the finance department, but the budget is always presented has always had that approach of putting all personnel services, not just for this department, for, for many departments together, and then including in a paragraph to make it clear as to what's in there. Um, so I don't know if Sean or Son, uh, Sonia have anything else to add, but otherwise we can go on. Uh, Mandy, um, you had your hand up for a long time. Yes. Um... Thank you for everything. It's been very informative. I have four questions, I think, for the chief, and then one that's more of a statement, but was kind of directed at Paul and Sean. And that one's based on, and I'll start with that one, um, in hearing about all the maintenance, in knowing about what our central fire station, um, what it's not just status as a falling apart building, um, but also its status of not serving the needs of a 21st century fire and EMS department, is it really time for us to, as a council and as a town, to say we need to start building and funding that new fire station south of town um, and figure out a way to move DPW out temporarily to get that done? Because have we reached a point where putting money into all of these small repairs is you know, not only that is not worth it, but also we just can't do the job our firefighters need to do. So I just want to put that out there as mainly for Paul and Sean and the rest of the council. But for the chief, um, a couple things. 
One, I think is a quick, easy answer, which is, do we actually have separate dispatches for fire and PD? Uh, if I no. call them, <laughs> I thought it goes to one place and whoever that is dispatches no. who it is. So how does my no, 911 no. call, I've always thought it was fire we, and PD. We, we have, have a combined police fire, fire dis, 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 dispatch. That's, that's, we, we had had that here for, for, okay. for years. So it, so that's that's the thing, and and they they just just and they, they only di dispatch for uh, Amherst, the town of town of town, town of Amherst. We don't we don't do any other di di dispatch dispatching for any anyone any other you know the municipal probably. And before I forget, you had asked about the re regional hazmat di di dispatch. That uh, uh, that uh, we've been doing that. Good God, at least. Oh, you know what? Probably eight eight years now. Uh, when I when I when I when I came came here, I'm I'm uh, still, still part, part, part of the regional have hazmat uh, team here. Uh, when I when I came came here, uh, the state was look, look, looking for a sec, 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 a second facility, so, so a back a back, well, well, uh, back 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 up to the one that they have in. Uh, They've had in whole in whole 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 work for some 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 time. So being part part of the team, I said, you know, why why, why not am am Amherst? So uh, so so we've 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 got, got we've had a, had a, had here since about my second year year here. And with, with that, we are paid. Uh, the town has paid ten thousand dollars a year to host to host so to host that. Mm -hmm. And it's not just just about backup. They are they're, they they are prime for all for for Western Mass and that that backup for Eastern Mass. And they can take take on the whole the whole state if if whole if Holbrook goes down as whole Holbrook can take take over if we if we go down. Okay, thank you for that. Um, my other three questions. One is just a there's there's a mention of a community emergency response team. So I'm curious. Yeah what that does, but let me ask my other two before you respond to that, because they kind of relate to each other. Um, yes, false and accidental alarms on your, yep. on your service levels represent yep. half of all calls. I'm curious whether that's a normal ratio for fire departments. And then similarly on EMS, um, on the total EMS calls and all, there seem to be about 800, given what the split out is, 800 patient contacts that aren't classified as either transport or treat but don't transport so i'm curious what those sort of on this list what those missing calls yeah. are all right i'll give i'll give give the uh either the either the ems question to uh jeff olmstead on on the false alarms and that that type type of thing that's it that's yeah that, that's average and i think and in in a way that that's a good good thing because we encourage folks to call even you know, even it, you know, sometimes they 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 might they might might be embarrassed embarrassed because it's it's a small thing or or, or and 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 for the and in 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 the grand scheme it might might be, you know, in 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 con, con, consequential, but we encourage folks to call. They have they have a problem. A problem. They have a. I mean, and most of the time it's a smoke smoke detector that 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 won't won't shut 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 off or that or something like that or they. I don't know, we've 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 gone out for uh, bats, you know. So I mean, you know, it's all, all kinds of things. But you know, the, the false 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 calls that 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 means that folks are called called calling us for for, for help. We want them to be in the ha habit habit of if if there's an, an issue, give 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 us a call, and we're and we'll and 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 we're on we're on on the way. And, and that and you know, false false calls they have happen. Uh, accidental issues they ha happen. And that's and that's all and 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 that's okay. Uh, Jeff, you, you want to want to weigh, weigh in on, on the, the either the EMS side? I'm going to start off just following up uh, your lead on on the prevention side, which is I, I would not want anybody to walk away feeling like a lot of these um, accidental alarms are coming from repeat um, addresses or residents. They're not. Um, typically, if there is, we address those to make sure that the fire life safety equipment is fixed and repaired. So they are spread out and fairly randomized. So we don't really deal with a lot of repeat uh, folks where we need to think about violations and stuff like that. Because I know that's come up in the past and I just kind of wanted to clarify that. As far as the data information, we had an issue in our data collection related to the software uh, program that we use. 
And when we had done some uh, changes and had some upgrades, uh, inevitably we, we broke something else. And we never really recovered some of that data to be able to separate it out. So we have the cumulative data and some of those points, but we lost on the specificity of the individual data points. So unfortunately, I don't have a better way of giving you uh, the numbers this year, but I'm hoping next year to be able to have a little more uh, articulate, um, you know, process for you and better data. I'm just curious though, you look back on multiple years and patient contacts 5,000 in FY18, but transported is only 3,800 and mm -hmm. patient contacts treat no transport are 300. That still leaves this thousand. What I'm just curious what that is, like what type of service is that? The separation between those two are being requested for service and having the patient largely refuse to be transported to the hospital. So in the broader question, that that's, that's where that separation comes from. And refuse treatment too? Um, yeah, generally, you know, not always. They might want us to, you know, we'll get a chance to assess them. We will try to often talk to people and say, look, something's obviously happened for us to be here. We'd be happy to take you to the hospital. This is what our concerns are. Um, and these are why we think you should see a higher level of care. And ultimately they make, if they're competent and capable, that they can make that decision to say, you know what, thank you very much. I'm all set. And, uh, and they're going to go about their day. Um, and we get a refusal from them that they don't want to be transported. Um, and we document that. And then it shows up as a, as a call because it is a call for service and we did spend time with them, um, but it's not something we bill for. So if somebody refuses to transport, we don't bill for our services um, to meet them and assess them. Jeff, a lot of those are also uh, patient assist assist lifts these days, correct? Which we're seeing a lot. Yeah, we're seeing a higher quantity of, of lift assists and requests for people to be lifted off the floor that aren't physically capable of getting them themselves. Some of those have happened in facilities that, you know, um, are group homes or assisted living. Although, interestingly enough, a lot of those cases dropped out after the beginning of COVID. We've actually seen a decrease in some of those. So it'll be interesting to see how the fall or even next winter, if that swings back the other way. Is that something that community paramedic insurance company, if we got that working, would be able to then sort of reimburse for? probably not a lot of them a lot of it really comes down to uh, people as they obviously become older and uh, are less able sometimes to uh, maneuver and get around a lot of those lift assists are from folks that you know for example they get out of bed in the morning because they need to use the bathroom and they maybe don't get their feet underneath them before they go um, or they have a variety of medical conditions that make it more complicated for them to, um, to get up if they fall. But none of us, you know, all of us want to live independent lives. Um, so inevitably, that, that, those two are in conflict with those sometimes. Um, and we try to take care of both sides of that form. So the answer is community paramedicine probably doesn't address a lot of those directly, and especially from a financial standpoint, unless in some cases, say the house was unsafe or had uh, poor living conditions, or there's something that we can do to help them get more services. In that case, we might be able to prevent some of those falls. In a lot of cases, it's really um, you know, more, more about the, uh, the folks and where they live. And, and, and ultimately, a lot, of, a lot of companies that support assisted living or group homes um, are looking for us to be more of their muscle to help lift people because people are heavy and um, those individuals sometimes get hurt um, when they're picking people up by themselves. Anything else, Mandy? Uh, just an explanation of what the community emergency response team is. That is those are, those are uh, citizens, citizens, citizen volunteers. They want to give back to their community. It's, uh, it came, came out of FEMA. And what what it is they and it's a uh, more in the emergency man management function, and our our group we have an active group here and they uh, and they and it's pretty pretty much all fund, funded by grants. Uh, we we go to that we do I go go out and, and, and get get state state federal grants and you know to, to support them for their train, training and equipment. Uh, 
you know, we, we, you know, they they can help, they can assist, assist with tra tra traffic during a some 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 kind of kind of disaster, weather weather event, something like that. They they've assisted with the uh, the half half marathon marathon that 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 we've had had here. They've assisted assisted there. They they were going to step step in uh, when when we were uh, when 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 uh, we we first began again to deal with COVID COVID and our our home, homeless population. Population. They were going to assist, assist us with with the uh, shelter, shelter uh, for the the uh, isolation shelter. Shelter. We were going to put up, put up, put up, put up. They can assist with shell, 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 shell sheltering. So then, oh, and and what and you know the, the wide variety of tasks that they can do to support the town in in the emergency man, 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 management fun, functional air area. Uh, they uh, train on uh, train train on first first first, first aid and generally emergency emergency management uh, tra traffic control that that type, type 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 of thing and being and and you know they're trained to be part of the emergency man man management public 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 safety safety team so and it's all they're all and they're all all all, all, all volunteers they're unpaid. They take they take it's 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 their own their own time and it's really it's it's it's, it's a great great fun bunch of folks they they just want to give back 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 to their their community unit so they're so they're you know an ad an ad junk of the fire department that sounds fantastic thanks oh, that's cool it is cool they're but they're really cool cool folks yeah muting I wanted to follow up on two different um, pieces on not not at the department level, but on state legislation. So on the community paramedics, if um, I know Medicare is its own uh, being, but if we said that um, if it, if our state reps uh, mm. pushed for it to be covered as a service, um, the same way home care is covered, and often that's only covered if a doctor has ordered it or said this person should be treating. So I'm just looking for where uh, we could reach out to for a legislative piece. And then um, for the lift and assist, it's interesting that I heard you say that it's declined with COVID um, because in the big facilities, I would say probably the Arbors and Applewood because they were really trying to limit anyone from outside coming in, period. But First question is, do we ever build the facility for that call? Um, and if we don't, could we? So could we build them? And the second, in terms of licensure and accreditation, um, Applewood is independent, but an assisted living is a licensed facility in Massachusetts. And I went on the, their criteria, and they require training to prevent a fall but they don't require training to pick up someone when they've fallen. So if we could change the wording of that, um, I understand, you know, they would have to, it's the same way a nursing home has to be very careful of back injuries and train staff and have two people come and pick up. But in assistant living, they're regularly helping people bathe, um, helping people get in and out. So I'm looking for a way, and, and part of it is, how much of a cost of this to the town is it that we don't get paid for? So if we're looking for revenue streams um, through these two different, so you don't have to answer it right now, but if we could quantify it and say that it would be helping the town out through these two different routes, one, either bill for lift and assist, so there's an incentive um, for at least the assisted living place. So I don't know what kind of budget impact that would have those two pieces i'm gonna i'm gonna try, I'm gonna try to try to both those um so for the lift assist specifically we do not charge anybody across the town regardless of at home residents or assisted living or group home we treat everyone the same in that format so if someone would have to make a decision about whether we continue that or not um and whether or not maybe there's a process for, hey, we do so many of these for free before we start to uh, address the issue of, of a cost. One of the things that's come back is that the idea that that bill would be then transmitted down to the actual person who fell. 
instead of it being covered by the company or the organizer of the facility. And so that's, that's one problem um, to go along with that. So there's parts of that. The cost really is our time. And obviously a time is valuable, especially with our staffing levels, what they are. Um, that is a big deal and the number of calls are a problem. To go back to your original part, if you were looking for an avenue, I believe that Minnesota in fact has um, their version of Mass Health that helps cover community paramedicine and they have a fairly robust community, mar community paramedicine program. So I think if you were looking for an example to go and uh, see what that template looks like, that might be a place to go look. Okay, thank you. I actually know the Minnesota, yeah, can follow up on that. I think that's great. Thank you for that lead. Yeah. Anything else, Kathy, if not, I'll ask Dorothy. Dorothy? Okay, um, just a quick thought to Kathy. Um, charging for lift assist can lead, have unintended consequences and leave, lead nursing homes to do what they were doing and are now not su supposed to do, which is tying people into their wheelchairs to avoid falls. And I've seen them tied into their wheelchairs. Dorothy, I don't think these calls are coming from nursing homes. They're coming, uh, nursing homes are still picking people up. Oh, no, they, they are coming from nursing homes, many of them. That's what I read on the paper. So I'll, I'll try to hit that a little bit. They're more, nursing homes are allowed to pick people up. And in fact, they are allowed to use the equipment to help pick them up. Interestingly enough, by regulation, the assisted living facility is not allowed to use that mechanical device to help pick people up. So they have a a disadvantage on that aspect due to regulations. Mm. Now, why that regulation is there, I'll let someone else figure that out. Um, Cause I know they don't want to necessarily cross these two boundaries because money's involved um, when it's done. But in fact, you can use a, say a Hoyer lift at um, a nursing home and you can't use a Hoyer lift at an assisted living facility. That's based on regulations. So my, my question I still had was, um, and looking at the wording, um, I want to know how the, how the funding and how this works. Is it, are there any costs tied to the rescue task force um, training to public safety partners um, for the fire department to develop an active, an active shooter response plan? So I'm assuming that you're a partner with the police department and that they're in charge of active shooter response? And you're being trained well, to work with them, or? Well, this is well. I'll have Jeff. Jeff. Jeff is in charge. Charge of that team. But I'll. 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 I'll start. 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 Start it for you. We. We train with. Uh, we. We train. Train with all. All three police. Police. Police forces here. 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 Here in town. As. Uh, we have a group of ten. They're called Tag. 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 Tactical medic. They are there to protect the. To. To. Uh, to, to treat treat the police if if they go down in, in a situation like that or the victims right uh, at the at the scene and they're and they're and 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 they need to train to to, to together so they so that uh, our our folks know how to keep themselves safe in 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 a dy dy dynamic situation so uh, and and that tra training I mean that's that's that you know for our for our folks it come comes out of out of our train training training train, 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 Training by the, 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 the budget, and, and that's and that's and that's and that's just just the way the way it is. The, uh, the, the, our our the, the, the rescue ta task force is one one of those things specifically for a multi -cat 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 casualty event, a vi vi violent event. So our our so we we train our depart department to go in. Snatch to snatch, snatch and grab, grab folks and treat, treat folks, get get them out of the, out of the dang, 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 danger zone. And it's a it's called a rest, rest, rescue task 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 force because it could have happen at any time. And you're going to use your on duty people. So we train train them how to uh, rec, 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 recognize threats, have, 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 hazards, how to work with the police, and how and how to save and how to how to how to save 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 the. Victims, Jeff. Jeff can be more specific on, on that. So I'm gonna, I'm gonna try to delineate a little bit between the TAC medics we have and the and the the four of us that do that. We work specifically with um, the police departments in some kind of you know dynamic or unique event. It could be crowds. It could be if they were doing warrant entries. 
It could be um, a specific type of, of hazardous event. And what we do is we give the TAC medics helmet and basically ballistic vest because that's a tool. That's a tool how we keep safe because in that environment, the only people that are, are able to protect each of us are the officers and the tools that we bring with us. And we have extra training in trauma and treatment um, in hazardous and unique events where we basically are the only EMS and medical care that can be provided in that space. The problem is for active shooter, when you spread that out, no one ever knows when that's gonna take place. And because of the number of potential people in a mass casualty, one TAC medic by themselves can't treat all the people that are gonna be there and much less know when to have that TAC medic available all the time. So when the active shooter, I'm gonna give you three stages. The first stage being the event happens and the police respond and the police neutralize the violence that is occurring. At that point, you have people who are injured and not able to be moved. The police are still trying to ascertain whether there's more than one person. Have they got all the people that are causing violence? And they create a opportunity for us to get into the place that is hazardous. And we would go in them with a team. And that team often would be two of our medics teamed up with two of the police officers. And those two police officers provide my street medics that you see every day. They provide protection for those two when they go into the building. And then they can get inside, assess patients, treat patients, because time is of the essence at that point. And we probably aren't set up to actually move them out of the building and get them in an ambulance at all at the same time. So TAC medics are very specific to the four people who do it. The active shooter involves all the medics that work. And we use the team approach to provide protection for them when they go into the building, they exit the building with patients um, and do treatment. So. We do some similar things with them um, and we do work with the police departments to make this work, but we need to provide training to the entire department on how to, to successfully do that. Thank, Thank you very much. Okay, uh, Mary Lou, and I think at that point maybe we catch everyone. Mary Lou. Okay, uh, just a couple. The uh, I would think that the liability of becoming a paramedicine team would be extremely high. Certainly doctors have high li liability insurance. So if, if we had this team, we'd have to have that type of insurance, correct? That's for Jeff. <laughs> no, the, all the, the, uh, the work that we're doing is within our normal scope of practice. So there's no type of care or treatment that we're doing. Um, and ultimately we live in a high hazard uh, job. We're firefighters. We go to fires. We go to hazmat scenes. We do water rescues and we do EMS. And this is really, and we do technical rescue, high angle, trench, confined spaces. This is really just part of that job and part of that envelope that has, you know, over time expanded, um, but it's become a very relevant thing because of the type of situations we're seeing in the world today. So you're saying that if we went to community paramedicine, we wouldn't need liability insurance? On the community paramedicine, no. As long as we were working within our licensure, within our scope of practice, um, and working with a state, we, we, we shouldn't need an additional um, liability format to accomplish that. So it's when you start stretching out into things that you aren't, you know, supposed to do or allowed to do, um, or try to go beyond that, that's where you really get into questions. So really staying within our, our boundaries um, that were provided by the state is where we, you know, kind of our safety net. Oh, that's good. All right, under mutual aid, uh, we have mutual aid coming in. I'm assuming that's because all the ambulances are out. Um, and do we have to pay the towns that provide that? And tying that in with uh, mutual aid out, um, is most of this going to Hadley? And if so, are we charging them because they have, they already have their uh, EMS? Uh, mutual aid is just just that. It's it's an agreed agreement that you know if, if we we need need help, folks folks will come come here. If folks folks need need help, we'll we'll go go there. We don't we don't bill bill for that because if we we go and we and well for the on the, the, the EMS side. If we if we go, we we uh, pick pick up the pay 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 
patient treat and tran tran transport, we we will bill that that uh, that pay patient. So that's that's what that kind of and so that's so that's where 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 you see the. It's not not that we're bill, billing to the town. We're bill, billing the uh, the pay, pay patient, and and by 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 sort of versa, if folks, if a, if a service service come, comes here, we uh, they'll they'll treat uh, treat treat and tran, 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 transport. They'll bill the pay, 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 pay the patient. So so no, so we don't we don't bill each other each other for for, the, for that that type type of thing. And the second part of your question was. I was curious as to how many uh, calls we make to Hadley now that they have their own service. Yeah. I want to say that number, and I don't have it right in front of me, was around 50 uh, last year. Um, so, you know, there was a little bit of a bump, um, but we expected that. Um, they are using other services as well, Northampton, uh, South County, or South Hadley, depending on the location. Um, so we do have it in our contract that if we do so or a certain number of calls that we would bill them. Um, that's something that we really haven't uh, addressed um, directly. Uh, he he was close. It was actually four four forty nine times we went. Sorry, late. not not to the fifty. <laughs> I'm was sure. Good <laughs> okay, thank you. That was a pretty good estimate. Come on, don't give him a hard time to. I have to. I have to. Come on, he broke <laughs> broke my chair, so I, I, I have to. <laughs> so anyway, um, I want to thank you. I don't see any more hands up. This has been very informative. I again appreciate you having uh, worked it out with Chief Livingstone, and I'm assuming that you're um, going to get compensation from him and some. He part. owes me big. He owes yeah. me big. Yeah, um, <laughs> Uh, but anyway, thank you very much, all three of you, uh, Lindsay and Jeff, and uh, we appreciate all of you having been thank with you. us, and it's been very informative and helpful to um, the we, committee. We also just thank you for the service to the town. You, you are an amazing team, and we know it. We've we've, we've got some special people who are work, working here, so that's that's the thing. I'm. I, I like to say I'm, I'm the luck, luckiest guy I got around because I get to work with these folks every day. So. Well, thank you. So, and uh, Pat, Pat is applauding you there. So, uh, <laughs> anyway, uh, that'll bring us on. Dorothy, I know, uh, sorry, your can came up late. Okay, I just wanted to say I appreciated um, his uh, Men in Black reference. Uh, I'm, in, I'm from the government and I'm here to help. <laughs> the first time I heard that, the audience laughed, and I thought, why are they laughing? Because I still do believe I'm from the government and I'm here to help. So I appreciate your sense of humor. All right. Okay, well, thank you. Um, so um, I said we'd do uh, public comment next, but there's no public in attendance at this point in the time. So I don't think that I have to uh, uh, do anything on that. And uh, which then brings us to the last agenda item for the day. And uh, unless, uh, but I do want to see if Paul, Sean, or um, Sonia have anything that they wanted to um, report at this point before we get there. Um, seeing nothing. Uh, so what we were going to talk about at the end was just make sure that we have it covered for um, how we're working towards developing the report. And uh, the three of us uh, who said we'd work on it, actually the one who gets the uh, gold star, uh, in the, a huge gold star is Mary Lou, who really did a great summary of the uh, elementary education budget and uh, is really a good model for the rest of us. So I asked Mary Lou, um, earlier in the day by email if I could share it with the rest of you right away and she said absolutely so at the conclusion of the meeting when we're offline I will to the list send uh, the copies uh, the, uh, you know, what Mary Lou drafted um, I think Kathy who's taking on the other one that was up was uh, the library but uh, 
um, we do have that, and that gives you an additional piece above and beyond the um, what we had already um, been looking at, which was what we were at last year. And uh, what I was going to do is take the narrative section and um, rework the narrative section as a draft to cover the topics that uh, sort of a general overview but instead of talking about the general budget process which was important for the first year of the council um, what i'm going to do is probably um, lay a little bit of groundwork just again even though we've heard it the council's heard it many times about the unusual nature of this year's process and COVID, just so for the sake of posterity that that's in um, our budget and uh, uh, that will be the launch to get an overview so i'll work on that um, as quickly as i can and i think that um, if you take a look at what mary lou did that it will give you a sense as you help to develop a section that is uh, specific to whatever department and you look at what was written last year and put the two put the two together uh, i think that that should be helpful uh, so is there any other thoughts that people have right now about um, the process that we're engaging in so that we're prepared in the end when after we have a recommendation to fairly quickly meet our deadline to get a report out to the council seeing nothing uh, is there any other unanticipated business that uh, i should be recognizing for discussion today because if not then uh, i think that the other um, topic i just wanted to uh, just make reference to pat angelus asked me a very good question this morning and i hope that i answered it as best as i could in a limited time but she was um, asking a question about what the anti-aid amendment was and why it affected uh, community services and social services funding and uh, I will uh, send that out a week from today we will be doing the community services budget and I'm going to make sure that that's available to you with anything else that I can find on the anti-aid amendment so that it's available to us at the beginning of that session um, it is a complicated topic and uh, so I'll just leave it at that for now, but um, I appreciate it, Pat. Thank you for bringing that up because it gave me a signal that it needed attention. Uh, anything else that anybody has? Otherwise, I think we, uh, Lynn? You have your, we're waving. Three of us have a, uh, would like to stay on and ask others to leave. And there were, I think, a couple people who were going to, do that after we adjourn. Yeah. Um, so uh, with that, I am going to um, adjourn the council. And when you uh, adjourn the committee, Lynn, do you need to adjourn the council? And I will adjourn the council. OK, so um, the records uh, were both at 4.50 PM. And thank you. And we'll see you on Tuesday. It's a rough process. Wow. but we're I appreciate you doing, we're doing great and thank you. So, uh,